Welcome into the Think Deeper podcast presented by Focus Press. I'm your co-host, Will Here, joined as always by Jack and Joe Wilkie. Coming to you live on a very cold day. We're supposed to get some snow here coming up if you're in the south. Um, these two guys being from Colorado, snow is not a very big deal to them. They saw it all the time here down in the south. People freak out about it. It's like the most exciting thing in the world. School shut down, all those things. And so we're getting to, to kind of enjoy that. Um, we'll, we'll see how, how bad it actually is. But uh, guys, we've got an utterly fascinating episode to get to today. Before we do, real quick note, um, with it being the start of a new year, we understand that a lot of congregations are trying to get their seminars planned, their gospel meetings planned for the year. And we just wanted to remind you of the seminars that we do offer. Quite a few. Uh, my dad, Brad Harib, has got uh, several that he continues to do. Um, Truth about origins, things like that. Uh, creation, evolution, uh, stuff from the family and the home. Uh, and then Jack and Joe and myself all have our individual, all of them are listed on our website, focuspress.org under the about section. If you want to take a look at some of the specifics, um, but for the purposes of this podcast, we do offer the think deeper podcast um, seminar, which is the three of us will we'll come out to your congregation, talk a lot about the things that we cover in the podcast, masculinity, femininity, uh, how the church can improve in, in various ways and discipling and things like that, that we're uh, we would love to come to your congregation to do, and then Joe and myself have the Godly Young Men podcast seminar. Um, we've got one coming up in a couple months that we're super excited about. We'd love to to come to your congregation, talk to your young men, uh, talk to all your men, not just be the young men. Um, and so I wanted to, to remind everybody of that again as the year is starting about um, the seminars that we do offer. But guys, enough of that. Let's get into our episode for today. Um, which is going to be, again, utterly fascinating. We're talking about Calvinism with this episode. We're talking about um, you know, predestination, all the things that, that come with Calvinism. And uh, it, it's one of those things that I think a lot of Christians have questions about. A lot of Christians kind of struggle maybe with some of the, because these are tough questions. There's a lot of the things that, I mean, Calvinism, the, the beliefs that surround Calvinism have been around for a long time. And so we're going to cover the, the five points. We're going to cover TULIP, um, the five points of Calvinism. And, you know, we're going to do the, to the best of our ability, address why biblically we can have answers to these things and what are the answers that we need to have. But Jack, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you as we dive into this episode. Go ahead and get us into where we're going to head with this episode and why we felt this was necessary to cover. Yeah, there's so much of this that's out there in the religious world that the more you get into Bible study, the more you see this stuff come up and uh, the things that maybe you get converted uh, by understanding the basics of the Bible are great, but the more you study, you realize there are some serious challenges that uh, really push us, really uh, uh, it's it's tough to get these things right and we want to get them right. And so uh, as we look at Calvinism, it's it, it has that name because of John Calvin kind of was the guy in the Reformation as the Protestant Reformation you know, exploded and went all the directions it did. Uh, he was the guy driving a lot of these doctrines. However, he didn't just uh, like invent them. Uh, I think there's sometimes that idea out there that he just kind of came up with all this and wrote it down. A lot of it can be found in Augustine, four or five hundred, you know, uh, A.D. Uh, other church fathers going back a few hundred years after the apostles. So it has a, a long history in Christianity. Things like original sin that you're born a sinner. Uh, things like uh, perseverance of the saints, which kind of gets twisted into once saved, always saved, things that you really hear out there in the culture. And the other thing is, these doctrines, not believing these, are some of the things that make people in the denominational world look at us in the churches of Christ as heretics, as you don't really believe the gospel because you don't understand these things, you don't believe in original sin, you don't believe in, you know, a lot of these things. And so uh, you'll hear the name Calvin, John Calvin, uh, was in Geneva, Switzerland, again, part of the Protestant Reformation. Um you will hear that his opposite was uh, Jacob Arminius uh, and, and Arminianism, not Armenianism. Sometimes you hear people say that. No, Armenians are people from Armenia. Arminians are uh, people who believe along what uh, Ar Arminius taught. We agree with him more than Calvin, for sure, but not fully. Uh, he still believed in some level of original sin and some other things that we wouldn't fully agree on. So we're not really either of those things. Um there was a quiz going around uh, on the internet the other day on kind of where are you on the Calvinist Arminian spectrum. We, uh, I took it, sent it to the guy, said you should take this, getting ready for the episode. Uh, it labeled me ninety five percent Arminian. I think Joe was ninety, and Will, uh, I think, yeah, yeah ninety one. Will was ninety percent Lutheran. So um, we've got our, <laughs> our resident Lutheran. Yeah, uh, yeah. Teased him. We're gonna have to get him the, the little floppy hat, uh, all that jazz. 
Um, At least that wasn't um, Billy Graham, though. Yes. So that's good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and it gave a comparable <laughs> for uh, this is this is who you're most like, and Will got Luther, and Joe and I got Billy Graham, unfortunately. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we're not. I was 90, 92% Armenian, so not, not okay. too far off. What okay. they meant was handsome, powerful speaker. I mean, that that's pretty much me. So, oh, you yeah, know, you're yeah. mainly you're you're mainly Billy Graham. So, <laughs> yeah, that's all right. I'll put up with it. Yeah, I'll put up with it. Uh, okay, so <laughs> <laughs> on that note, I'm not going to make the next Billy Graham joke. We'll just move on. Um, <laughs> Probably go. So, I want to add good. one more thing before I pass it over to Joe here for a second. There's a tendency, we talk so much on this podcast about the pendulum thing. You look at Calvinism, you're like, all right, that's wrong, so the opposite must be right. Not necessarily. There's some some ideas here that we need to grapple with scripturally that we do think it's wrong, but that it doesn't just automatically mean, well, we'll go the other direction, because that, that sets you up for failure when you just... When your doctrine is not based on what you found in the Bible, but just reacting to what somebody else found. So I'll, I'll add that yeah, as well. But Joe, what do you have to add to the intro here? Yeah, I would just say kind of words to that effect, which is you know, we're going to respect this. I don't agree with them. I, nobody here on this podcast agrees with them. Uh, at the same time, I cannot stand the gotcha. Hey, have they considered this verse? Yes, they have. They can probably quote it in Greek too. So let's actually take this in and, and be legitimate about it. And the way that we handle this, we're not just going to do the gotcha verse here. Essentially, it's not as simple as a lot of people want to make it out to be. This Correct. is a very convoluted topic. This is something that has caused, this has caused theologians problems to to deal with this for thousands of years and for people yeah. to like you're saying joe just take well this this one verse clearly just solves the issue no it doesn't like as, as joe said some of the most brilliant theologian theologians in the world some of the people with the deepest level of bible knowledge that i've ever personally studied also believe calvinism and that doesn't make them infallible that doesn't mean that they couldn't possibly be wrong about this but it does mean we should treat this subject with the the weight and the respect like you said joe that it deserves to not just say well here's the one verse that debunks calvinism not the way it works and so there are a lot of things that we're going to get to with this episode jack do you want to go ahead and get into the monergism versus the synergism thing um before we kind of really dive into the the five points that the tulip Right. So it's based on a, the Greek word, uh, ergon is, is just work. And so it's whose work is it? Mono is one, uh, sin, you know, sin is, is together, two things coming together. So it's all the work of God or it's God's work with our work. Um, and so there's, there's some other, you know, fancy $5, uh, words that, uh, come up in this conversation, but we'll just talk about those, but it's in our salvation. Does God do all of the work? And there's, you know, terms again, imputed righteousness versus infused righteousness of, you know, you were totally dead in your sins and God just did the whole thing. He made you a Christian, is making you into a good person, is making you stop sinning, is making it's you convert. It's 100% him, right. It's all on him. Or the the synergism is trust and obey. Like you're kind of bringing your own, your faith to God and saying, I know this is not enough. I need you to make me righteous and all that. But it, you, you chose to do it. Um, essentially that you and God are kind of working together to bring about your salvation. Right. Right. So synergy. Yeah. Synergy. Yeah. Um, so RC Sproul, probably the preeminent Calvinist, uh, kind of voice of the last hundred years, uh, had a, a thing I was reading on this where he was talking about, you were dead in your trespasses and sins and, and monergism, you know, like what this all means is you were a dead body at the bottom of the ocean. God went, scraped you up off the bottom of the ocean, pulled you up above shore, you know, breathed life into you, gave you CPR, whatever, you know, I don't remember the, how full the illustration, well, not CPR, you were dead. Like he brought you to life and all of that. And so you had nothing to do with the salvation at all. Like he chose you as a dead person and made you an alive person versus, I, you know, we don't really believe, we believe that it's God's work in baptism. It's God's work cleansing us of our sins, but it's, you hear the gospel call and you respond There's, to it. They would say you, gonna, your response is just God making you respond to it. I was going to ask you guys where you fall on that scale, because to me, it sounds bad to say that you and God or that me and God work together to, to get to our salvation. Um, because obviously we do believe Ephesians 2 8. It's not of our works. Like there's literally nothing we could do. We were dead in our sins. That part is true. But where to me the the monergistic view kind of falls apart, and where I struggle with with lining up 100 percent with that is like, as Jack said, there is still some level of responsibility that you have to decide, I'm going to go this route. I'm going to accept the gift of grace. God extends it, God offers it. I don't know. Am I off on that? The the view that I, I do feel as though there is some human involvement in I'm going to decide. Now, of course, I guess the classic monergist would say, you know, that God is the one who decided that you were going to do that. But in my view, 
me responding to the gift of salvation, me choosing to go down into the waters of baptism is where that synergism, I guess, would come in of, yeah, God is the one that is doing the work of, of bringing me salvation, but I have to accept it. Does that make sense? Well, to, to use the you know his illustration, I would say we're not at the bottom of the sea. We are treading water and and we don't know how to swim. You know, so we are going down and we will drown. We will die if if we don't get help. He throws out the life raft, you know, the, the life vest. We do have to swim to it. It is completely by him. He saves us. It's all on his work. Uh, there, There is no, wow, I saved myself. No, you didn't. He threw out the life vest, but you do have to reach out and grab that life vest, put it on and let him pull you into the boat so as to save you. And so there has to be some level of I am drowning, a recognition that I'm drowning. I think that's partly us and we're we can get more into this a little bit later but like there has to be a recognition of you are drowning there also has to be the willingness to reach out and and accept what god has freely given you which is grace uh, and so to me if you never reach out and get it and god does all the work for you which is monergism uh, again we're getting into calvinism where we may be getting ahead of ourselves a little bit here but yeah that's the way i would look at it using reworking his illustration we're not at the bottom of the sea we are fighting and and we are going to drown we don't know how to swim but he's freely offering it to us we just have to reach out and take it jack what are your thoughts on that well that's where you know they have the phrase regeneration precedes faith essentially that inside of you before the thing that makes you able to go yeah i I think i should go get baptized i think i should listen to god and, and read the bible and and become a christian right you don't have the ability to make that choice unless he turns the switch on inside of you um and so that that he calls you to that but all right, so to flip the the swimming and drowning illustration, remember as like 10 years ago now where you two uh, in conjunction with Apple gave everybody their free album? Yeah. And it was a disaster. Everybody People went nuts. Really, you know, were really mad about it. Like, I don't listen to U2. Why is this on my phone? I didn't buy this. Where did this come from? And after the fact, Bono, the lead singer of U2 said, that's not what we meant to do. We didn't mean to put it on your phone. We thought the deal with Apple was they're going to make it free. And if you want it, go get it. And so it was. They, he, he used the illustration of like, we thought we were leaving milk on your front porch. We didn't realize we were breaking into your house and putting it in your fridge. And so this is kind of, you know, God giving you salvation is like, here, here, you're going to have this whether you want it or not, which is one of these points of Calvinism we're going to get at versus he put it there for you, kind of the life raft you're talking about of like, he set it out and said, here, you can have this. Now, uh, again, that album, if they had put it in the iTunes store and you went and downloaded it and enjoyed it for free, nobody would say you paid for that. You still got it for free, even though you had to click the button to download it. Calling that a work is, is to me, absurd when you do something that simple, when you hit a button. Well, it's in the same sense of like, oh, you know, of course I'll become a Christian. I'll go get back you know, into the waters of baptism. Oh, you just did a work. like Right, they call it a work, yeah. Yeah, like, well, that was you trying to earn your... No, it wasn't. It was accepting a free gift. And when you accept a gift, you do have to reach out and grab it. It's still a gift. That doesn't make it a less of a gift if you have to download it, if you have to grab it, you know, whatever else. And so that monergism versus synergism thing... Um, you, again, the pendulum thing, you have to be very careful. Like you, I think you, know, you guys said of, it sounds really weird to be like, well, yeah, it's, it's our works plus God's works. Mm, no, it's all Christ doing the salvation. It's just not a work. Uh, like we have to define a work as one of the biggest disputes in all of this. This is why they call us heretics. They don't understand our view of it. They look at us as, I think it's Pelagian. We're, we'll get into this, but Pelagianism, right? Like we have our works and then God will make up the rest of the way. And so we'll kind of go 50%. He'll go the other 50%. That's not at all what we believe. Maybe some people in church kind of believe that. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why we're doing this is we want to correct the the pendulum thing that some people got wrong. Yes. With that. Yes. The works base. Um, but yeah, I think that's why we're called heretics by so many people there is they don't understand when we do view it as it is a complete work of God in us at the same time. And, and uh, Jack, you mentioned, Again, I'm trying not to jump ahead too much, but you did mention that specific point of, okay, did God, so let's use my water illustration. You have to look up and see that you're drowning. Now they would say, what causes you to look up and see you're drowning? That is a work of God in your life. So the work of God starts before. And I do think they have biblical foundation, which is what John 13, talking about the work of the spirit of like, he convicts the world concerning sin and judgment. Um, maybe 14, it could be off there on a chat. No, but it's, either no way, it's either of those, it's 15 or 16. Is it? Is it nah. <laughs> One of those that Jesus I'll, 13 I'll find it. You keep talking. You keep talking. Missed. Yes, it, it gets all jumbled for me there. But um, either way, what he's talking about with the spirit, it's not 15. That's the that's the true vine. Sorry. Uh, 16, it's gotta eight. Be, when he comes, he'll convict the world concerning sin and right. righteousness. I was way off. Okay. 
But either way, As he's usual. convicting the you should world. should study more, Joe. Which, <laughs> That's right. Doing. I really should. I really should. <laughs> You're spot on it. Um, but he's convicting the world the way John used the world, right? Those are those are those that aren't in Christ. He is convicting them, bringing them around. So it is a work of God to kind of pull our hearts unto him. But I would say, yeah. how does he do this is kind of the question. And how many how many people come to God after they've hit rock bottom? Why do they do that? Why did God decide to let them hit rock bottom from a Calvinist? I'd love to ask a Calvinist this before he then snatched them up. Or could it be that the circumstances of hitting rock bottom in their life is what woke them up to God, is what caused them to not rely on themselves, but rely on God. And to me, that's a very big distinction there of like, God put it in your heart to want him or God allowed the circumstances in your life to cause you to want him to wake up and go, well, I'm drowning. I need, I need a life raft. I need a life vest. It is a work of God in your life by bringing things around, but this is going to get us into kind of the Arminius of, of there is a, you know, resistible grace um, versus irresistible grace. So we can get into that discussion later, but I think that's a needed part of this of like, when does God's work start well, from this monergism synergism? We realize once we accept the gift, that's all on God, but did he work in our lives before that? A key word that is used in this discussion is the idea of regeneration, essentially the the new birth. And the the monergist believes that essentially that regeneration portion, again, when when the the new birth, it would it would tie into Jack's analogy of uh, not Jack, sorry, Sproul's analogy that Jack brought up of God is the one who brings you up out of the out of the ocean and, and he's giving you new life right there on the shore. To them, that's regeneration, and that was all God, and then everything from that point on is when justification takes place. Well, obviously we believe that the regeneration takes t- takes place when at baptism, which is when which prior to baptism again some kind of human agency has to be involved. And so I think a lot of the I guess discussion disagreement around that for us versus, you know, the people who would subscribe to monergism or full calvinism or whatever is when does that regeneration take place? When does that quote unquote new birth happen? When 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 is because to them, and I, I read a quote actually that talked about the fact that regeneration takes place before justification. I don't think we see it that way according to according to scripture. And so that to me is where the fundamental disagreement lies, is that regeneration for us takes place at and for us when I you know I say based on an understanding of scripture of the New Testament, regeneration takes place at baptism, as does justification. We're justified by the blood of Christ in the waters of baptism, which prior to that was an offering of God. God is the one who literally does the the regenerating, the justifying through Christ's blood in the waters of baptism, but I still had to decide to come to the waters of baptism. But again, their definition of regeneration is the, you know, basically the Holy Spirit working upon somebody's life. Well, if you don't believe that that happens at baptism, then that could happen at any point in somebody's life that would lead them to living a, the life of a Christian. Does that make sense? So, yeah, and right? where they get this is from, uh, especially Ephesians 2, 1, you were dead in your trespasses and yeah. sins. They, they put a lot of weight on that word dead of like, you're totally incapable. There's like, you dead people can't respond to the gospel call. So God has to make you alive and then you can respond to the gospel call. That's just not how Ephesians 2 works because it says you were dead in your dead in your sins. It goes on about like, uh, all of those those problems that um, the uh, the Did that happened to you too, Will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, you yeah. blipped, went off your mic, and came back. Yeah, I so, start that that's over. not just how Ephesians. That just yeah. say that's not how Ephesians two right. works, and start from there. Right. Everything was clear. So that's not how Ephesians two works. It starts off: you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Uses verses one, two, and three to talk about the state they were in. That you know, you and us, the Jews and the Gentiles, all were alienated from Christ and all that. Verse four, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, again, we were dead, made us alive together with Christ by grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Made alive with Christ and raised up with him. Paul uses that terminology elsewhere, like Romans six, that was at your baptism. Not months before you got baptized, God brought you to life and then led you on this journey toward Christianity because now you are open to faith because you're alive. No, right. alive means saved, not not like you're open to hearing the gospel now. And so what Will's saying, you know, separating regeneration from justification, that's not what that says there. It's, it's a misunderstanding. But if you do think somebody's dead and totally incapable of doing anything, it would require that. Well, I just think they're misreading well, the, dead. Well, in the context there in Ephesians 2, like you said, 
does denote being saved. I mean, even in verse 5, by grace you have been saved. Verse 8, by, for by grace you have been saved. He is talking about salvation there, like you're saying, not just, well, the Holy Spirit started working on their lives then, and that led them to being saved. That's not it at all. Um, Joe, anything to add to that before we move on? No, no, I think that's a good breakdown of it. Jack, I want you to get into, because I do want to hit the five points, or we're, we're bounced around a little bit in there. Um, I do want to get to that. But you also had on this outline that I think is a very interesting discussion. There is a difference between Calvinists and Reformed. And then after this, we do want to start breaking down Tulip. Um, but before we do, can you explain the difference between, because we're seeing this pop up actually a lot more, Reformed Presbyterian, things like that, Reformed Baptist. Um, is there a difference? If there is, what's the difference between Calvinists and Reformed? Well, I, so I think... Um... Reformed is kind of an, an outworking of Calvinism. When you believe Calvinism, uh, it leads to other theological concepts. And so these Reformed churches, it's very much covenantal theology that God made a covenant with the elect, these certain people that he chose to be saved. And so you act in kind with that. That's why they baptize children. I think it's a, a common misunderstanding in the churches of Christ that they baptize because you're born with original sin, that you're being baptized because of the sin that, you're, they, that they believe you're born in. No, that's not why they baptize their children. They baptize their children the same reason Abraham circumcised his children. You're part of this covenant family. We're we're keeping you in this covenant family. And and so the Reformed is practices around that. Basically, we're going to practice as a church the implications of Calvinism. And so it's not the same thing, but I think it's an outworking of it. That's very interesting. Yeah, paedo baptism is like kind of the, it's a hot topic these days, um, specifically if you're on Twitter, which probably a lot of people aren't on Twitter or X or whatever. It's X, um, Joe, come on. X, so, yeah, sorry, sorry, Elon. But um, yeah, that's kind of been making the rounds of like a lot of people questioning it. And that is a very common misconception of like they baptize so as to bring their kids and that's what saves them at baptism. I don't think they say that. Um, my question would be, Jack, you might know this. I, I feel like, I should know this, but I don't. They do baptize later, right? They baptize them as kids and then baptize them later when they when they come in. No, kind of as now. Do they not at all? I mean, well, if if you um, if you weren't, then yeah. But if if you were baptized as a child, it covers. So that is their baptism. Yes. Interesting. Okay. Okay. And for Calvinists, that's not necessarily because I remember talking with Bodie Bachum about it. Him talking about um baptism and that being did you just name drop that you talked about you did i did, I did. I did. Oh yeah I'm, I'm a i'm big stuff no um mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, he's he's one of the foremost i would say in the world on calvinists which makes me sound even more of a jerk in saying that but truly <laughs> like <laughs> the guy knows what he's talking about they do baptize later i don't think he's he believes in child baptism so this is kind of again well, your yeah yeah. this is yeah. the the difference he talks I wonder about if there's debate within the calvinism community among that that's what there, I wonder, there, there certainly is. That. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and yeah. so, yeah, I mean, reform doesn't all mean they all baptize their babies, but it is that covenantal thing, the family and. That's uh, very interesting. Yeah. A lot of other stuff. And I, I shouldn't talk about it a whole lot more because I'm not terribly steeped in the whole reform side of it. And I didn't sure. prepare on that end as much as I did on the Calvinism. No, end. that's OK. I'm kind of asking more questions than we had on the outline here. I'm just that is a fascinating thing. But I do want to use this to kind of springboard us into what is an interesting, because you talked about the total depravity, um, and this gets us into the outline of TULIP, as, as most people know, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. So if you ever hear five-point Calvinism, this is what they talk about. Not all Calvinists are five-point Calvinists. Some are four, some are two, um, where they'll accept some of these. But traditionally speaking, if you're going to listen to like a John Piper or somebody like that, um, they are five-point Calvinists. They they do go along the tulip lines. I think he even has a book called Tulip where he goes into these things. And the first one is total depravity, which gets us into, even as a kid, again, a year misconception, you know, our misconception surrounding child baptism. Um, we look at it as, well, you're born in sin. And that's where we get this is they do believe in total depravity, correct? So, Will, I guess I'll, I'll let you kind of take us into this one. Yeah, sure. So this is where I'm actually going to ask a question um, about the outline here, because Jack put on our outline for this total depravity section, born with a sin nature. And so here's what I'm curious about. First of all, I guess my question is, do they believe that or do they believe that you are born in sin? Like, like my my daughter right now, Brooklyn, is I'm about to be is about six months old. Do they believe that Brooklyn is is a sinful human being right now? Or do they believe that Brooklyn is born with a tendency towards sin? Because this is a discussion that I've had about this when it comes to total depravity and this idea of original sin. 
I believe that human beings are born with a tendency towards sin. Like essentially that we're not born on a straight line and we could go either way and just, you know, circumstances lead us towards sin. I do think because of the fall, Romans 5, you know, a lot of things we get into, we are born with a tendency towards sin. This is why you see a lot of young kids. So you don't you don't have to teach them, you know, how to be, you know, how to be how to misbehave. They kind of naturally seems like know how to misbehave. They, they lean towards that way. So, Jack, real quick, I guess before I continue, the classic Calvinist, what do they believe? Do they believe that my six months six month old is in sin or do just that she has a sinful nature? Yeah, no, they would believe that she's in sin. Uh, in fact, again, to use Vody Bauckham, Joe's Joe's friend, Vody Bauckham, my buddy, uh, Joe's my buddy, buddy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he would use the term "vipers in diapers." Like they come out, you know, just sinful, sinful little ones. Um, you know, they call them little sinners and stuff like that. And so and they get that from places like Psalm fifty-one five, right? Yeah, sin, my mother conceived me. And so you're born with Adam's sin guilt upon you, but also Adam's sin nature upon you. There's kind of the two sides of that. Okay. Um, and so yeah, you're 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 born a sinner. Um, I think what you said is a little more controversial than, than, uh, maybe you realize of, well, let's get into that question. So the idea of yeah. does every human is, is every human born with the theoretical hypothetical possibility to live the perfect life? I used to believe this. Actually, I, 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 I think, I, 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 used I think, think I've already. I was going to say, I think I've already shown yeah. my cards. I, I, I was going to say, I, I Will's out of himself here. I think everybody is born with a tendency towards a sinful nature. I used so. to believe that that was the case, that that you could theoretically live the perfect life because it, it opens up to a broader discussion of like, how is it that Jesus, you know, if he was a man like us and was tempted in every single way, but it's like, then you get into the virgin. This is where they get into the virgin birth and go see he didn't inherit the sin from the father. He didn't actually, his, his father was God who was perfect. That's how Jesus was able to live the perfect life is he didn't have a sin nature um, and, and didn't inherit the sin of, of Adam. So the virgin birth for them is a very big deal. I would look at it and say, no, I do think we are born with a sin nature now. And I think the sin nature, see, I have kind of a different view on it in the fact that I think God put it in man for man to want to be like God. And I think the great, um, the great story arc of the Bible is that we do get to be like Christ. And that's kind of him calling us into that in salvation. Where does Eve go wrong? I that be was like the God. original temptation, right? Correct. Yep. That was the original temptation, the original sin. From that point on, our wanting to be like God has gotten us into every sin known to man. And every man, every, every person wants to. Well, you don't come to salvation until later in life long enough for you to already test out being like God. Little kids are tyrants. They want to be their own parents. They want to be their own person. They want to be their own God. I think that is the bent that we have and that will always lead us into sin. So that's my belief personally. All right. So that le does create the questions that you brought up, but didn't really answer. Uh, were Adam and Eve born with that bent towards sin? And was Jesus born with that bent towards sin? I think they were born with the bent toward being like God, wanting to be like God, which I think he would have eventually, I don't think he would have been God, but I think he would have eventually given him that because that's what he gave us in, in salvation. So they were born of that bent. They cheated the system. They, they short circuited it. They said, we're, we're going to yeah. do this. Yeah. Circumvent. We're going to do it on our own timeline um, instead of allowing like walking with God and allowing him to make us in the way he wants us to. I think that's the nature that he gave him. I don't think God gave him a sin nature because obviously that would have made God the author of just sin. to flip it around give them free will to flip that around. Let's say the serpent never, never, you know, entered the scene. Would they have lived a sinless life that they had literally no, no, no tendency to lean towards what Joe's saying. Like, in other words, would they have found a different way to sin? Because you always hear people that say, man, I'm sure glad Adam and Eve messed it up because I definitely would have messed it up. Well, what are they telling you right there, though, that, that their nature is to lean toward the thing that they're not supposed to do? So I'm curious, Jack, what your position on it is, if you disagree. <laughs> so there is an hour long uh, Who Let the Dogma Out uh, season one episode on this entire topic. So if this uh, interests you, uh, check that out. Um, I would say Adam and Eve were born without that nature, that that nature is part of the fall, the fallen nature. Uh, and, and the virgin birth is why Jesus doesn't have it. I mean, it's a federal headship mm -hmm. of Adam. That's why you have the first Adam, the second Adam, because some people think this is heresy, but I, you know, like 
then you have to explain. Uh, so the the term for that is Pelagianism, the idea that man could be innocent, the man is born perfect, no inherited ten tendencies, and this gets into a lot of philosophical uh, philosophical stuff like the the tabula rasa. You're born blank slate, nature versus nurture, and all of those like really big debates. I think a lot of well-meaning Christians accidentally side with the humanists on this one, which is basically mm -hmm. man is perfectible through education and training. We could get yeah, the perfect man. Well. That's not true because one of the other things is, what do we got? Eight billion people on the planet today. Um, so let's just say that the the total population in human history was twenty billion. How many perfect people do we have? If you hold Jesus aside, if you, you know, we're not counting him. Obviously, we know he lived a perfect life. How many people have grown to maturity and lived a perfect life? Well, none. Uh, all no. have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, there's none righteous. No, not one. How many have gotten within? 10 sins of living a perfect life. Probably zero. Yeah. No. I, I mean, definitely zero. How many have gotten within 10,000 sins if they've lived long? Like if they've lived to, to die in their old age, right. nobody's even gotten close. So you start right. talking about statistically one in 20 billion people hasn't been able to come within a thousand sins of, of a perfect life. What does that tell you? it's pretty astronomical odds that somebody would be able to. The other it's not possible. I'm not saying it is. I'm not advocating for the idea of it being possible. I do right. think we have a nature, a sin bent so, nature. This is what I'm saying yeah. is that, uh, that that's why it's not possible. Like is because we have this nature. Um, and people would say, well, then Jesus, you know, had it unfair differently than us. No, Jesus had the same conditions Adam did. Uh, he had the same opportunity as Adam did. Adam went the wrong way. Uh, and, and this is all the stuff that Romans five gets into. And this is where the Calvinists get it wrong is they read Romans five twelve. Therefore, just as through one man, Adam sin entered the world and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. They, they misread right. that and say, Oh, Adam made everybody, you know, have a uh, have inherently sinful. Killed. No death spread to all because all sinned. Like er everybody participated in this and perpetuates it. Um, but then verse 19 for as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Well, how does that work? How were we made sinners through Adam's disobedience? Well, because now, and you might say, well, we don't have a sin nature. Look at kids emulating their parents. Look at the two-year-old, as, as you mentioned, like misbehaving and all that. But, you know, if, if their parents have an anger problem, the kid has an anger problem. Well, you know, I sin in the same way Adam did. I sin in the same way my parents do. I Like, it, it's just... It's something that carries through. And so I, I think this is something that I, well, I know when we did the dogma episode really makes a lot of Christians uncomfortable. And this idea that we don't have the possibility to be perfect, that it's not fair. It's not, no, we're, we're humans. We're children of Adam, but we're being made into children of Jesus. This is the whole Adam Jesus right. contrast. So, uh, no, I agree with you guys that there, there's a bent there. You're not born guilty. You're not born totally depraved. Uh, you're not born bearing Adam's sin guilt, because I still believe in the age of accountability thing. Uh, because Romans yeah. 7, a couple chapters later, that's where Paul says, there was a time I was alive until the commandment came. Right? That until I understood right and wrong, I was alive. I was okay. there. I was right. innocent to a point, and then I stopped being innocent. And it wasn't, I never did anything wrong until that point. It was, I wasn't accountable for the wrong I did. But again, to make that point about the 20 billion people, this this idea that people have would lead you to believe that somebody would go, oh, all those things I've been doing were wrong. Stealing toys from my little sister, that was wrong. You know, uh, uh, hitting my little brother on the head, that was wrong. I didn't realize that. I will never do that again. And they never do. It doesn't happen, right? And why doesn't it happen? <laughs> sin, sin nature. So, uh, again, that terminology makes people really uncomfortable. But again, there's... The statistics, Romans 5, 19, all that plays out. The Calvinist view on this is they say we are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. I would say we sin because we inherited the the tendencies that our parents and everybody back to Adam has. The other thing is what makes it total depravity. This is where they say you're so dead. You for the Calvinists, yeah. Yes, for the Calvinists. They say it makes you so dead you wouldn't be able to choose God unless he chose you. Unless he, again, flipped the light switch on to let you come to faith because of how sinful you are. We don't agree with that portion of it. Well, that and that leads us into kind of the second aspect of it, right? Yes. Yeah, 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 let's else. go ahead. So the second point of that would be unconditional election, which is kind of, I would say, the the most well-known thing about Calvinism and, and their Calvinists and what they believe, and that is with the doctrine of predestination. Essentially, God chooses to save, or God saves whom he chooses to save. 
that God handpicked, you know, before time began, these are the people that are going to be saved. These are the person that are, the, these are the people that are going to dwell with me forever in heaven. And so that's where, like Jack was just saying with the total depravity point that you would have absolutely no hope unless God chose you. That's what, you know, the, the to, you know, you're totally depraved with unconditional election. And I read, I remember I actually read a Piper book because I, I had, I had known about uh, predestination and, and what they believed. But I read a John Piper book called The Pleasures of God, and man, he spent about 40% of the book really pushing this idea of, of election and, and predestination. And one of his points in his book was God takes pleasure in who he elects. And I remember reading that, and you know, it's just really hitting me. Like They truly do believe that God, from the beginning of time, chose this person is going to heaven, this one's not. This person is going to heaven, this one's not. And when Piper put it that way of this is the way God chose it, it just really woke me up to the fact that, wow, that's 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 crazy to me because as somebody who grew up in the Church of Christ, of course, free will, we get to you know choose all those things. But let's go ahead and give it the their due, their due justice here. Guys, and Joe, I guess I'll hand it to you. Where do they get this idea? Because there are quite a few verses that would, you know, a simple reading of it would lead you to believe that maybe there is such a thing as as, as predestination or unconditional election, as they call it. Yeah, Romans 9 is their champion passage, uh, I would For say, sure. their their biggest one. And that in Ephesians 1, we'll look at Romans 9 first, um, starting in verse 10. And not only this, but there was Rebecca also, when she conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and compassion on whom I have compassion. And I'll just read the next verse. So then it does not depend uh, on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. Essentially, God's calling all the shots there. Yeah, Correct. And then he says also in verse 18, so then he has mercy on whom he desires. He hardens whom he desires. Uh, talking about Pharaoh and, and hardening Pharaoh. So this is the first one. The second one I'll just jump to while we're while we're thinking about it uh, is Ephesians one. And he's just going to say uh, in verse four through six. Well, he says in verse three, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ himself, according to the kind intention of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. So he chose us in him before the foundation. He predestined us to adoption as sons, um, according to the kind intention of his will, not our own. So these are their two champion passages to say, hey, there's the elect, right? There are those who he chooses. There are those who he does not choose. Uh, and, and specifically those who he hardens toward him. And that's the, uh, again, you're, he basically, is, and there's two different, and I can't remember the term, specifically but like there's calvinism where they say okay he just chooses one and there there's a two-part where it's like not only does he choose who's going to heaven he chooses who's going to hell and double most predestination thank you double, double predestination so essentially Which like that, the other one would be he picked a certain amount of people and said all of these people are going to heaven and maybe other people like can or he picked all these people are going to heaven and everybody else goes to hell and I, I think I most of yeah most of them ask, because how do, how do you of the, do one without the other yeah right because of the other things of you're dead without God calling you or whatever so I, I think that's a pretty minority position that would say it's only single predestination so so who wants to who wants to take this who wants to unravel kind of uh the Romans 9 approach here the the Ephesians one to me is very easy um in the fact yeah. that I shouldn't say very easy but I would say the term we use is plan not man. Yes, he did predestine Christians. He did choose Christians. Those who have chosen Christ have been chosen from the foundation. His people, the plan that he had to make them his people was laid out from day one. The, the redemption story arc, you know, from, from the beginning of time, they looked at one another. The, the God had seemed to look at one another before he even created the earth and said, okay, this is how it's going to go down. One of us is going to have to go down and, and do it. Jesus says, I take this one. This is Philippians 2. He humbles himself, not a considering equality with God a thing to be grasped. He says, I'll take this. This is going to be my project. I'm going to speak them into existence, and I'm ultimately going to go down on the cross. And I'm going to save them. That seems to be the story arc, like the, the path of redemption set out from the beginning. The plan was set out that those who accept me as Lord and those who want their relationship with God 
will be my people and I will treat them as such and I will take care of them and they'll be my bride, Ephesians 5, right? That, that was the predestination. That was the well, predestination. I mean, the, the term oh, that just shows up over and over and over in Ephesians 1 is in Christ, in him. And who is, so who is the predestined? Anybody who's in Christ. Right. That's where the blessings are all found. And one of the blessings is the fact that if you're in Christ, then I guess you were one of the predestined. You know, I guess because he predestined the plan, not the man. So that's what I would say to Ephesians 1. Um, Romans 9, there are still an an there's, there's very much an answer to this, but it is a little more nuanced. It can be a little more difficult. Jack, do you want to take Romans 9? I can take it. You can take it. Will. No, I got it. Joe, to, Joe to take Ephesians 1. <laughs> yeah, pass off <laughs> the hard one. Yeah, what exactly. Move, Joe. I've got Romans 9 unless, like Will, that. Uh, unless you want to. Go for it, man. Go for it. Okay, so Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. That's a quote from the Old Testament. That is not, uh, you know, just all making that up. Uh, that goes back to Malachi 1, verses 2 and 3. Um, and God kind of telling the people of Israel, hey, you guys got special status. When he says, you know, he's saying that to them, not, I picked Jacob to, be, to go to heaven and Esau to go to hell. That's not what he's saying. He's saying the people right. of Israel have had special blessings, and the Edomites, because that's immediately what he goes to start talking about is the Edomites, verse 4, though Edom says. So that country... I haven't given them special privilege. I haven't given them special opportunities the way that you guys got. And so he's talking about a corporate group of people like we just talked about there in um, Ephesians 1. But the other thing is, if you go back to Jacob and Esau themselves, obviously Jacob was the good brother. Jacob was the the chosen brother, the, the one through whom it was all going to happen. Uh, and Esau was not, you know, he, he sold the birthright. He married outside, he married Canaanites. He had all these problems. The last time you meet Esau... He's a good guy. He's a changed guy. He's he's blessing his brother. He, you know, Jacob thinks he's going to kill me. He's going to, you know, I'm going to put the ugly kids up front because, you know, I don't know if Esau's going to attack us kind of thing. Uh, I'm joking about the ugly kids. It was, you know, like Leah's kids and the 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 hand or the, the handmaid's kids and all that stuff. His like, favorites and not favorites. Yeah, literally his favorites. He he saved the back because man, Esau might come in guns blazing, and I can't have that. And Esau comes in super cool. Like they 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 reconcile. Like it, it's good. You got pretty good reason to believe that Esau was probably saved at that point. Like he had repented, he had come around. And so if Esau is saved, if Esau is right with God, that really debunks this whole thing of, well, God just chose him to go to hell. Like, no, you see a repentant, regenerate man here. And the other thing is, when you go to the, back to the Malachi thing, that God chose all the people of Israel, didn't choose the people of Edom. Does that mean every single Edomite went to hell? Probably not. Uh, in fact, we've got Edomites throughout the Old Testament. We can go into that. Does that mean every single Israelite went to heaven? We know that's not the case. Uh, you know, Ahab, probably not going to be there. You know, there's, there's like some really, really bad people who are Israelites. And so this idea of, oh, this means predestination. This means God chose these people. He didn't just handpick Jacob goes to heaven, Esau goes to hell. He also didn't handpick the Israelite people go to heaven, the Edomites go to hell. There was a lot more involved in that. And so I think where people make this about God playing eeny, meeny, miny, mo, playing action figures and says, you're the good guy, you're the bad guy. That's that's really struggle, overdoing it. I struggle to reconcile that idea with, you know, the passages that talk about God desiring all men to be saved, you know, and that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So obviously, that's first Timothy two, second Peter chapter three. The other thing that I would bring up about this is, and I, and this is one of those things I I almost wish we had somebody who believed Calvinism on the podcast to kind of answer the the, the questions that we're throwing at him. But I even look at a verse like John three sixteen, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, not the elect. God didn't just choose to love a certain group of people, um, and so that's again I just always struggle. If, when I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of somebody who believes in these things, I always come back to verses like that. I mean, again, First Timothy two, Second Peter three, John John three sixteen, God loving the world, because it, it in essence it seems as though free will is being taken away, and that just doesn't. It might be kind of an emotional way to answer the question, but you know, is that a God that we truly want to serve? Of one who literally has already picked and chosen from the minute my somebody's kid is born, yeah, they're out of luck. Sorry, you know well, what I mean. I'll say to that, the, is that a God we want to serve? And I think this is a valid critique they make, like, well, if he's God, it doesn't matter if you want yeah. to serve him or not. So, I mean, fair point on that. But the other thing, they would look at, like, a John 3, 16 and say, well, that whosoever believes in him, whosoever are the people he picked, John 10, they'd flip over to that, that the sheep that are but, mine will hear my voice. And so, 
you know, that's who's going to believe. That's that's the people, you know, and, and so they. Well, then what would the love to the world being shown? How, do, how does that work would be my question. To that. They would look at it as it's God's love that saves some and God's love that condemns some. I mean, it, it, I don't think that's a strong argument, but that's, I think, what they would say. That's and they do say to to the second Peter three, nine, um, their answer to that is that they have there's two different wills of God. There's kind of an overarching and I'm spacing on the names was like the decreed will. And there's another one that's kind of like, yeah, maybe that's it. Like there's two different wills. There's an overarching will, which is, yeah, God, God would love everybody to be saved. But in reality, there's the will that he works within that he knows uh, no, that's not going to happen. They wouldn't. I, that, that's uh, I don't but, think they would say that. I, well, so we're going to have a free well, episode next week. Spoiler alert. Sorry. Yeah, so I, we're, we're going to say true. A bit. what they would say to the second Peter three, nine is he says, God is patient toward you. And so, oh, Peter was talking about the elect, that God's waiting for all of the elect to be saved. That's why he's being patient. The The idea of, of the uh, permissive will that God permits, well, no, if, if you're hyper-Calvinist and, and it's unconditional election and irresistible grace, you don't have that choice. But this is, this is what Piper says, is the two different wills of God, it's the same as, yeah, he wishes for nobody to, to sin. God's, God's major will is for nobody to sin. While at the same time, happen. he knows like with Judas, that has to happen. Judas has to sin in order. So did God decree Judas to sin? Well, it's to do different wills of God. That's what he gets into is, yeah, God wished for all to come, quote unquote, sure. But in reality, that's just the elect. And so there's the two different sides. He wishes for nobody to sin, but in reality, he needs Pharaoh to sin. He needs Judas to sin. He needs other people to sin to bring about his will. So he allows those things to take place. It's a very sketchy argument. Well, and this is this is where the hyper Calvinism, the no free will thing really falls apart of like he made him right. do it. You know, he, he right. made Adam and Eve sin like he he decreed they were going to do it. So he, he is the author of sin. Right. He decreed the fall uh, and and everything that was going to what they would happen. say. Right. That, that's so. the logical implication of, of what you're where you're going there. Right. Let's get guys. We've, we've got a uh, three more points. <laughs> we to better hit. jump into it. <laughs> and we got a whole free will episode next week. So we should probably uh, uh, bury that. So, yeah, uh, sure. well, let's go bit. ahead and go to the third point, which and all these tie together. It's not like these are completely separate. But the third one is limited atonement. The idea that Jesus only died for the elect, that he did not die for the whole world. And anybody who wants to can take advantage of it. He only died for those who were going to take advantage of it, so to speak. Um, and so I'm going to, Joe or Jack, I'll, I'll let you read the, the quote that you've got on here. I'm going to jump to several of the places where they would go in scripture to support that idea. Um, Matthew 20, 28, just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. They would point to that and say, why didn't he say, you know, give his life as a ransom for all? It clearly there just says ransom for many. Um, Acts 13, 48 is another one um, that they would go to that says, uh, da, da, da. now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed again, another piece um, of scripture that they would use to go to that idea. And then Hebrews nine, verse 15, for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant of those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So um, I'm actually going to turn it back over to Joe here for this one. Um, for essentially, how do we rebut this, this idea of limited atonement that Jesus only died for the elect? And now, now you throw it back to me. Um, I do yeah, want to read welcome. that verse. I, I do want to read, or not the verse. I do want to read quote. that quote actually real fast because I think this is very interesting. This kind of opens you up. This is the R.C. Sproul. Um I don't think we want to believe in a God who sends Christ to die on the cross and then crosses his fingers, hoping that someone will take advantage of that atoning death. Our view of God is different. Our view is that the redemption of specific sinners was an eternal plan of God. And this plan and design was perfectly conceived and perfectly executed so that the will of God to save his people is accomplished by the atoning work of Christ. To me, Interesting. I look at it and I say, do we want to believe in a God who dies for a subset of people he comes down he he jesus is willing to leave everything to come down to die for this very specific subset of people doesn't offer it to anyone else so billions over over time will end up dying and he knows that they're going to be away from him and there's a difference between him knowing and him decreeing that he's that's chosen, my biggest right. issue with that is he's chosen that that many billions of people will go to hell so god doesn't love them God doesn't care for them. Like to me, where capitalism breaks down is it's not even a verse by verse. They got their verses. We got our verses. We can get into this, Jack. I'll let you kind of, I did, I'm not even rebutting the verses because to me, it goes against the idea of who God is. 
Like it, it's, this is a well, character of God question, not even a biblical as much as a character of God. He wishes for all to come to repentance. Well, no, he doesn't. Not really. Um, we know that he's well, just, we know that he's kind. Well, just is sending everybody sort of, to hell, I right. suppose. Yeah, I was going to say he's kind of like, he doesn't give them any chance at all. So he knows they're going to hell. He's, he's putting them. Well, it says God's loving. Yeah, but not really, not for everybody. Well, it says God's like, you start going down the list of who God is and all of these things check off the boxes to me as to, well, not really only to a certain sur- uh, subset of people. Is he those things? You always hear things like, well, God wants people to serve him who want to serve him, like the people that chose him. Did you really choose God if God was the one that chose you to choose him? That's kind of a weird way to put it. But, right. does, you know, does that make sense? Like, yeah, God wants those who want to serve him. Yeah, but if he picked, if, if he knew ahead of time and, and hand selected and picked, yeah, these are the ones that are going to serve me. I know we're trying to save the free will point. I get it. But to me, it, it really does make us into robots of like, yeah, we we're, we're robots. It was decided ahead of time that we were going to serve God and these other people were not. Yeah, I, I hate to – I typically do try to boil a lot of arguments down to common sense, and I don't want to do this with Calvinism because we did start the episode by saying it's not as simple as it seems. It is one of those things that, that just does kind of logically break down, I feel like. Literally, uh, what is the purpose of planet Earth? If you're already going to have these people and nobody has to live life to, to get there and you're going to have to save them, why didn't you just make more angels or make humans that already went to heaven with you? If there is no free will down here, again, I will save that discussion, but if there's none of this, if it's not on people planet who are Earth, choosing to serve you, yeah. And if it's not people choosing to serve you, why did you not make more servants for heaven and just bypass this whole thing? You had Jesus come down to die for that. Why? You could have just had him not die and just made them perfect and put them in heaven. Like to me, it makes Earth worthless if well, there's no possibility of that. The other thing is the atheists criticize God for creating hell. Well, why would you create hell? Why would you create man so they go to hell? Fair challenge, except for the fact that he came and gave himself to rescue us, to offer us the, the life raft out of hell, went through everything he did. If he literally created the majority of humans who ever lived to be eternal firewood, that is yeah. pretty messed up. And what they do to that is they go to Romans 9 and they quote the, well, who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? I'm not answering back to God. I'm answering back to your version of God. I mean, like it's it's a very nice rhetorical right. game to play there. Uh, you know that God, yeah, He has a will. He has a, a way He wants things to work out. But this idea of He created somebody and gave them a zero point zero point zero percent chance of being saved that they are automatically like before they are even born, you know, He He stamps them on the head of marked for hell. Man, that's uh, that's, that's a pretty tough hard. pill to swallow. Yeah, yeah and messed up. you know the sprawl quote is I don't think we want to believe in a God who sends Christ to die on the cross and then crosses his fingers hoping that someone will take advantage. I I do want to believe in a God who says you know what even if they don't choose me I would be willing to do this for them. Right, that's a loving God. That's yeah. that's again the character of God. In our way, I think the character of God stands stands firm. In their way, you really start to doubt it. So you look at these verses, and then we're going to move on to your resistible grace. But you know, what do we say to verses like um, Hebrews nine fifteen? Which right? I mean, let's, so let's give been, them let's give them their their credit here. <laughs> as many as were appointed to salvation, that's pretty hard to. I mean, like that. That's as we said at the start. This is not a simple. Oh, this is so stupid. I can't believe people believe it. As, it it's it's hard. Right. Do you guys see a difference between? And this is the way that I've always kind of thought about it in my brain. A difference between God chose those who were going to inherit salvation as opposed to God knows those who are going to accept salvation. Like, does that make sense? I don't know if that's a distinction that is even worth bringing up here, but in my brain, that's kind of been always the way that I've distinguished it is I don't think God, like you said, any, many, money, mo, hand, hand shows this person, yes, this person, no, this person, yes, this person, no. But he does. He, with him being omniscient, he does know, and I don't. I don't know if that would tie into this. What are, what are y'all's thoughts on that? That is one of the kind of alternates. I think uh, Arminius actually believed kind of like that, and it's the Calvinists will almost talk like this sometimes. Of like, well, how did he pick the elect? Well, he knew who he was going to pick, and so he made them the elect. Like uh, to me, that's the same thing as as what we believe, just adding a step onto it. Where we say, well, it's right. it's going to be anybody who's in Christ is going to be saved. And so he looks and he's like, well, who's going to be in Christ? Them? That's the ones I'm picking. Like, well, then you don't need to do that. That's like circular then, reasoning. Right. Almost. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Working backwards. Yeah. So looking at these verses, I would say, so let's go to, let's work our way backwards here. Um, Because I have Hebrews 9 pulled up right here. So he talks about, um, since death has taken place for the redemption transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of, of the internal inheritance eternal inheritance 
Uh, to me, I would say, and this is kind of the Armenian is like, I think he calls everyone as those who have chosen the call. And so, yeah, to those who he has called, um, if you accept and listen to the call going to John 10, as you brought up, you know, hearing his voice and going, yep, I'm following that. I think the voice goes out. You don't think the you know, the wolves hear the voice of the shepherd as well. There's only those that know it. And they say, well, those that know it are those that are given to by God. And I would say, no, those that know it are those that accept. I need the, the shepherd. I need the good shepherd. Well, that means you were called in that way. So the voice goes out to all, but those who accept it are those who were called by him. Does that make sense? That's, that's, you're looking at me. Uh, you're looking at me as pretty skeptical. He's so calling much. all, he's calling all men, but only those who answer the call would be called the called. If that makes sense. Well, I think it goes back to the, the Holy spirit, you know, convicts the world of sin thing, uh, to righteousness and to judgment that, you know, some of them are going to go, Oh, I'm a sinner. I need to repent and, and trust in Christ. And others are going to go, I don't care that's wrong. You can't make me, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And so, uh, maybe along those same lines that might go with what you're saying. Um, I'm saying like, okay, let's say you have a a football team, you know, a coach, and there's a ton of people on the field, and he he shouts out to everybody, and there are those that listen to the coach, and they go, okay, that's my coach, and I'm going toward him. And he goes, okay, you guys are the ones I called. Yeah, technically he called everybody to come over to him, but those that came over to him are those that he would say, I called you. Does that make sense? No, that's a little pathetic, honestly. Oh, no, I didn't. You guys that didn't listen to me, I wasn't calling you anyway. <laughs> no, it wasn't. He said, I did. I am calling everybody. If you listen and you come, that's I those get what you're who, saying. See what I mean? Like, as they get closer, he says, I did call you. I also call those other people. They blew me off. This is the point of, is it, and this gets us into the next one, irresistible grace. Is it resistible or is it irresistible? I would say it is resistible. I do think he puts out the call to everybody. I think that's the whole point of salvation. I think the Holy Spirit tries to convict everybody concerning sin and judgment, but only those who allow themselves to be. And this is the, the difference between us and Calvin. And they say, you don't allow yourself to be nothing. He just does it for you. I would say we do allow ourselves to listen to his voice and to come to him. And there are those who resist it. Those who don't resist it are the called. Those who do resist it are not the called. Even though he died for everybody. Everybody has that opportunity. The, the Holy Spirit is convicting the world. I would say everybody, everybody outside of Christ convicting the world concerning sin and judgment. They're all getting convicted the same. Some people are resisting and some people are not. This gets us into Romans 1. There are those that absolutely hear and it's evident. It's made evidence. There's like five, six times in there. It's made evident to them and they choose to turn away. They yeah. choose to follow their own God, idolatry, LGBTQ. It goes into all sorts of other things. Like that's those who listen to the call and said, nope, I'm not going to do it and went to the other way. Well, we're not going to call them the call then, are we? I don't know. How would you answer? Okay. If, if I'm way off on this, how would you answer Hebrews nine? Cause your answer is kind of like, yeah, that's difficult language. Like we have to have an answer. Otherwise, <laughs> would, that not make, <laughs> would that not make the Calvinist right? How would we answer this? Don't get quiet on me now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think it makes sense. Um, yeah. I mean, your phrasing is, is a little strange on it. So, uh, and I guess that goes back to the, uh, it's a different way of saying the same thing as what we said about Ephesians one of like, that's how, you know, who the predestined are is, is afterwards. It's the same and, thing for Matthew 20, 28, give his life a ransom for many. He, he was willing to give his life a ransom for everybody if they would have chosen. But since only many are the ones that chose it, he just goes ahead and says, I'm going to give my life a ransom for many. Does that make uh, that, that to me is, is tying into directly what you're saying. I'm going to go, it, it doesn't look like, we have a rebuttal for Joe's Joe's thing there, so I'm going to go we'll ahead and move stand. into yeah. the irresistible grace point because be super where, I, where I've always wanted to jump to whenever I whenever this irresistible grace because irresistible grace is the idea that essentially once God chooses you, there's nothing you could do to say you know I'm not gonna I'm not gonna serve God you know it, it is irresistible grace has been bestowed upon you it is irresistible. What do they do with like the parable of the Great Supper? Where or the you know where God where Jesus is is using the 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 story of he invites all these people and they say yeah sure but first let me do this and then first let me do this and first let me do this and he says all right fine I'll go choose to or I'll also open up the invitation to these people who do choose to to decide to come to the to come to the feast does that make sense so in other words the people the people rejected the invitation 
it was there. They chose not to accept the invitation. They had more important things to do. By definition, does that not make the quote unquote grace resistible? What would you guys say to that? Yeah, that. And I mean, just really, as I said, with the Jacob and Esau thing, like not all the Israelites were saved. They were the chosen people. They were all chosen. And I mean, the whole first generation of them all maybe went to hell. Like a lot of them went, you know, weren't saved because they didn't obey. They wandered in the wilderness until they died kind of thing. And so um, they, they were handpicked by God. I mean, they saw him part the Red Sea and all that stuff, and they still resisted. Uh, and so I don't, I just don't get this idea that, oh, well, you just, if he, he picks you, you can't say no. Like, well, a bunch of them did. And like you said, the parable, that's the same thing. That was, you know, Israel has been called. You didn't want it. Okay. I'll go to the Gentiles. Right. I, to me, that's a slam dunk. That's why I don't want to spend a ton of time on this is like the whole point of Romans nine, 10, 11 is guys, you kind of fumble this one. I did call you. You rejected the Christ. You know, I'm I'm grafting in the Gentiles into this tree, right? Um, to me, that's not irresistible. Like, I, I don't know. So that is their champion passage. But I look at that saying, this is exactly it. As God did call them, they did say, no, I don't want this. And he said, okay, I'll go. We're going to include the Gentiles into this plan for people who actually do want this. I still am not, I don't know. I'm, I'm still, I know we have to move on, but I'm a little unsure on, uh, you know, going back to the last one of, of where we're at. We he didn't even cover, yeah. uh, well, we didn't even cover the Acts 13, 48 of those yeah, who are appointed, appointed to salvation. eternal life, appointed, appointed to, to salvation, life, yeah. which people, people are going to listen and go, whoa, 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 whoa. You can't just skip the verses that are difficult. Um, so irresistible grace to me. I think we broke that down. It does not really make sense. It's one of those that, and I don't even think there, there are Calvinists that, like I said, not everybody's five point Calvinist. This is one that I think some people disagree with, um, even in their own cir circles and such. So irresistible grace, I think is just, uh, again, like we said, we want to treat with respect, but kind of dumb in that respect. But going back to this fellas, before we get into the last one, because I do really want to know, what do you make of as many as have been appointed to eternal life? Gentiles heard this begin rejoicing, right? Uh, glorifying the word of the Lord, as many as have been appointed to eternal life, believe the word of the Lord is being spread throughout or through the whole region. Um, so this is again, Paul, um, going out on his first missionary journey. I think it starts in 13. Yeah. Starts in 13. So this is just on his first missionary journey. So what do we make of that, of those who have been appointed to eternal life? I, all right. I'm going to admit the, the Acts 13, 48 one is probably the single most challenging one, uh, just because of the wording of it. Um, I would say, first of all, there's the biblical interpretation principle of you kind of, uh, always interpret the complex in light of the simple rather than the simple in light of the complex. Um, and I think the simple really indicates that everybody has the opportunity to be saved, you know, John three sixteen things like that. Uh, number two, there is a lot of wrangling over the Greek, not only the word, but the tense of the word as far as appointed to eternal life uh, in Acts 13, 48, uh, that it wasn't like a, a long past tense thing of like, oh, they were appointed like that, that's something that was over with and done, but like kind of like in that moment, the appoint they were being appointed. And, and so some would say that was by the preaching of the gospel determined who was appointed to eternal life. And it was kind of, again, the ones that responded to it were the ones that were appointed. The third thing is this comes right on the heels of, of verses 45 and 46 is where Paul and Barnabas kind of throw their hands up with the Jews and be like, look, you guys got first crack at it. You didn't want it. So we're going to the Gentiles. But he, uh, interestingly, and they say, since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Well, how were they unworthy of eternal life? By hearing the word and not accepting it. By their and actions. So, right. By by their response to the gospel. Well, what makes somebody appointed to eternal life? Their response to the gospel uh, is, it would be one of the arguments of that. I think those are fine. I don't love any of those three things. Uh, you know, like I said, this is one of the weaker ones that's out there. I still think it holds up just because of when you start playing scripture wars on this, I think we've got the big guns. We've got the ones that, uh, you know, the overwhelming majority of evidence points one direction, but yeah, this, this is a challenging one. And if you say it's not, I think, uh, <laughs> you know, like let, let's not, uh, we don't have to oversell our case here. It's the yeah, same as called. Enough. I can, I can use my football illustration, but it is difficult <laughs> to say, you know, uh, and, and the John 10 and such this one, as you said, rightfully said, this poses a little bit of a challenge. I do think this is why I go back to what I said. I lean on the nature of God and I lean on logic a lot more in this. And that sounds terrible. To, what are you? You're not going to lean on scripture. Like, 
we can go back and forth on scripture, but by and large, let's zoom out. As you said, let's look at the simple, not the complex. Let's look at the simple and see what we know of God. Fellas, let's get into the last one here, though, because I think this is running long. Um, Perseverance of the saints. And this is, it's not the same as once saved, always saved, um, per se. But I do think those things kind of run together in a lot of ways. Like they, they do... These get mixed, if that makes sense. And we hear this kind of in Baptist circles and such. Once saved, always saved. Once you have accepted the Lord in whatever means they, you know, so like the Baptist sometimes will do a sinner's prayer or whatever. But for Calvinists, like once you've accepted God, you're in, you're good. You're not going to lose it. Now, they build in a very interesting caveat. And I think it's it's very convenient for those that have accepted God and those that stay faithful must be the elect. And those are the saints, right? The perseverance of the saints. Therefore, if you made it all the way, now, then you go, well, what happens if somebody falls away? Well, it's not that somebody falls away. They just never really were saved in the first place. They were place. never saved anyway, right? They never really were saved. Like, they they weren't a saint. They weren't one of the elect, because if they were the elect, they would have stayed. They would stay there. So it's like, okay, so for the five years where they did seem to be showing good fruit, and did seem to have it, what then? What would you say? Well, they weren't the elect during those five years, I suppose, because they couldn't have been. If they left after five years... And the election never took place to begin with. Am I botching uh, this? I mean, I, mean, I, I point like to a guy like uh, Josh Harris, you know, big, like his dating goodbye guy, you know, a huge yeah. name in the Calvinist world, uh, denominational world. And I mean, preacher, book writer, I mean, just a, a, a mega church pastor, celebrity kind of guy that they had on all their conferences. Well, now he walked away, left his wife, you know, with for another woman and he's not a Christian. He doesn't even believe in God anymore. And they look back and they're like, well, I guess he wasn't a Christian the whole time. Like, well, then why did you have him on your stages? Why did you let him run one of your churches? A biblical example of that. What about Demas? Demas is literally called a fellow laborer by Paul, and then he forsook him, loved this present world. The Calvinist is forced to say Demas, even when he was laboring with Paul and was a fellow worker, somebody who was shouted out multiple times by the Apostle Paul, yeah, he wasn't really a Christian. He, he wasn't really saved. He wasn't really a saint. Like that, that, that completely falls apart there. Well, and the biggest issue with this is how do you have any confidence at all? I read John Piper on yeah, this. Yeah, or somebody asked him and he basically said, well, I'll know if if on my deathbed I've, I've stayed faithful. Like, so you can't know, you know, oh, well, 10 years from now I'm going to fall away. Like, we know where your status is. We can check right now and be like, I'm saved. And if I do certain things, I'm not going to be saved. And, you know, right. I, I can be confident that I, I can lose my salvation. I can be confident that I have it. If it's kind of, well, well I don't know that I have it until I get to the end and didn't lose it. There's no confidence. There's no assurance. Just to illuminate the difference between, once again, Joe pointed out, it's not necessarily, once saved, always saved. Those who believe that essentially believe once you make the decision to become a Christian, there's nothing you could do to, you know, basically ruin that. Like you can basically live however you want and you're still going to be saved. The Calvinists, those who are the, would, for the perseverance of the, of the saints, would say, not necessarily that, just so the true measuring stick of somebody who is a faithful Christian is one who stays faithful all the way to the end. And like you're saying, you're not going to know that until your deathbed, yeah. until you're dying, yeah. right? And until you know if you stayed faithful. And so um, there are a couple verses that they would point to as well. It's again, give it their due justice. And I'll read Philippians 1 verse um, 6. Uh, Joe, if you want to get First yeah. John uh, 2 verse 19. Uh, Philippians 1, 6 starts in the middle of the sentence. So I'll go back to verse 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. So kind of the idea that the good work you're doing now will be completed when you have fully persevered as a saint, right? When when your time is up, Joe. Yeah, um, we got First John two nineteen. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. Um, and then he says, verse twenty. But you all have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. Um, so the idea here, once again, they would look at that and say, see, they never really were of us. I, I think we have to look at the context of First John of what's being talked about. Him talking about um, those that were in it, the Gnostics that were in the church kind of doing their own thing. And he's saying they never really were part of us that yes, they were in the church, but they never really were part of us because they were Gnostic in their teaching. And they were just trying to confuse those that actually were in the truth. That's way different than somebody who is standing next to us, believing every last thing we believed the the good works, everything else, like for years on end versus 
somebody who's Gnostic from the very beginning kind of, yeah, they were in the church, but they were a faction of the church that really was never a part. To me, that seems to be the context spoken of in first John, uh, first John two there and not people who were like tight, tight. We believed everything you believed. And then we just decided to stop believing. What I would love to know is from a parenting perspective, kind of how this affects their role of parenting, because as you were talking, Jack, about Josh Harris, another one that comes to mind is Abraham Piper. Mm -hmm. John Piper's, I think, oldest son uh, or one of his sons in there. Um, And he is now a devout atheist and on TikTok is trying to lure people away from the faith. And I think uh, Josh Harris is doing the same. He's got his own or at least he did for a time. Deconstruction course. Yeah, yeah. deconstruction course you could pay for. Um, I think there would be a special place in hell for people like that. Millstone hung around the neck. But um, yeah, you have Abraham Piper. Well, man, that would be terrifying as a parent to go. Is he elect? I, I just don't know. I don't know if God's going to choose my kids. I really hope he chooses my kids. I have no no dealing over whether he yeah, chooses my kids. I will try to lead them up you to, have it. to Yeah, well, what to parent appropriately. you have to try to parent appropriately? Yeah, I mean, if God's already chosen, God either chooses them or doesn't. They'll figure it out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He, it's chosen or not. And, you know, okay, what if they are with the perseverance of the saints? How do I know they're going to remain elect for the rest of their life? I will never feel good. I'll never sleep at night that my kids are actually going to choose the faith because they may not be the elect. I mean, they may not persevere, right? So to well, me, so their thing, out. they always just go back to God's sovereignty. Well, then if, if, if that's God's choice, that's for the best. I, w- I think I would know better that I want my kids to be saved, but God knows better than me, which is just kind of, as everything that's we said, just out. doesn't really make sense. Doesn't, doesn't add up. I would say two things about the perseverance of the saints. Number one, this of the five is by far the most easily attacked and you can just tear it to pieces throughout the new testament i mean galatians who bewitched you and you know you he says you have fallen from grace um i I like to ask why does the book of hebrews exist if you can't lose your faith Mm. the whole book is like you can't go back to judaism or you're trampling jesus underfoot so don't do it don't do it well if they're not gonna do it then you don't need to write that book. Like if it's not possible for them to lose their faith, if they were going to do it, there's nothing he could have done to stop them because they weren't Christians in the first place. Then you're just right. saying, oh, the, the book of Hebrews was written to non-Christians. That doesn't, I mean, come on. Like, and so right. number one, it's really easy to debunk. Uh, number two, if you debunk one of these five pillars, the rest of them fall apart really easily. Because if somebody was predestined, and the the grace was irresistible, and they were as unconditional election, like all these things that we just went through, and yet they can lose their faith in the end. You just unraveled. I mean, the, the entire yeah. the whole yeah. all the petals fell off of it. I mean, like, and so I I, I really think if you're gonna uh, Bible study this with somebody, argue it with somebody, whatever it may be, go after this one. It is so abundantly clear that throughout the New Testament, throughout our own personal experiences, people have the faith and lose it. And they lost it due to what? Their choices. And if you can lose it due to your choices, what does that seem to indicate? You can gain it due to your choices. Choices do matter. Uh, But this is why it's such a big deal for them. You go, how could they believe this? They have to. They have to. Because if you believe that it's a call from God, did God make a mistake? Well, clearly they're not going to say God made a mistake. So they have to believe in the perseverance of the saints. Otherwise, they'd say, well, you can through your choices lose it. Okay, that would indicate choice does matter, which is going to get us into our next episode on free will. Here's where I want to end. We got a great one coming up uh, next week, as I said. So stay tuned for that. The reason this is important, uh, I don't think most of our listeners are Calvinists. Uh, I would I would figure probably 98, 99, maybe 100% of our listeners are not Calvinists. And they. so we didn't convince anybody here. We want to speak to the other side of the pendulum very briefly before we wrap up. Pendulum swings happen all the time, and, and I'm sorry to say, but the Church of Christ is notorious for this. We avoid the verses that we that we want to avoid. Ephesians 2, 8, we've been saved by grace, right? Uh, by grace, you have been saved. We avoid verses like that, and we swing the other pendulum. Whoa, 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 whoa. But let's go to James. Let's look at all the works. We can do the same thing here. We can look at it and say, okay, Calvinists are coming from a place where they believe we don't have any good, totally depraved, right? There is an aspect of that that's very true. We are depraved sinners. We need to recognize that and recognize our own goodness does not get us close to God. And I do think, I want to speak to this before we wrap up. I think there's a lot of people in the church that take that 70, 30, 80, 20 approach. God, let me go 80% of the way. You make up the rest. Whatever I don't do, I'll, I'll do as many good deeds as possible. Maybe they don't say this specifically or, or explicitly, but I think they have this belief. I'm going to be as good as I can be and where I fall short, God will carry me the rest of the way. 
That is flat wrong. The difference essentially that he does not make up the difference. You, you have nothing to bring. All your good deeds are as filthy rags, as Isaiah says. You bring nothing to him. So sanctification is the process of being made like Christ. Right? It's the process of after we've been justified at baptism, of him really turning our desires into his desires. Um, that's that's a very needed part of this discussion. But the way we look at it is our works kind of bring us closer to God. No, they don't. They really, really don't. We have been saved and we've been offered a gift that has nothing to do with us. This is how I can read Ephesians 2.8 and go, absolutely, of course, by grace we have been saved. I didn't do anything. It, he gave me a gift. I reached out and took it. That doesn't mean that I earned the gift or anything else like that. We just need to be very careful in the Church of Christ to not, and, and I'm speaking maybe to the older generations, there's a lot of people that did not know what grace was until their 20s, 30s, 40 years old. That is pathetic. All we wanted to do is hellfire brimstone and talk about how much we needed to work. This is in a response to Calvinism going, whoa, we're not Calvinistic. No, but maybe you are a Pelagian, right? Maybe you are somebody who is really does think you can get it right on your own. Please don't. Please, please do not push that. And please teach grace, the doctrine of grace. We have to have that. It's not Calvinistic to teach that we need grace. So that's just my, my soapbox here. Um, I, I was recently talking with two people who had left the faith. They were in their 50s, uh, two women who left the faith. And they're like, it's weird that to hear you talk about grace because we grew up in the Church of Christ and we never, it was, I was literally 40, I think she said 46 years old before I knew what grace was. Church, we got to do better. I'm just going to say, we have to do better. Do not swing the pendulum back to ultra works because we don't want to be Calvinists. No, we don't. We want to be biblical. We want to be Christians who teach the entire uh, understanding of scripture. And that includes grace. So I'll get off my soapbox that there. Is the but sorry, fellas. That is the perfect way to wrap. I hate to jump in here. The only thing I was going to add to that is if you do happen to be listening to this and do, I guess, side with uh, you know, maybe a more Calvinist perspective on things, we would like to hear your, I guess, rebuttals to what, what we've said. If you if you are somebody who believes these things, kind of you know, comment. Let us know, hey, this is why. Here's the rebuttal to what you guys said on XYZ issue. Here's why I believe in XYZ, you know. This is the hopefully the place for discussion. We're going to have another segment for those who subscribe to Focus Plus, the deep end segment. That will be a very interesting one if we can get, you know, maybe some some rebuttals to the things that we've said. That hopefully we will again turn scripture back on and say, well, this is why that might be wrong. But I, I, again, I just want to just want to say, let us know. Um, and maybe you don't believe. Maybe you've heard how someone, how a Calvinist might answer something that we brought up. We want to know. We, we want to have these discussions. We want to bring these things up. We don't want to act like it is again as we started the episode with that. It's just super simple because it's not. But Joe, that was a really great, great way to wrap. Jack, anything else to add before we wrap this week? Not for me. All right, we will stop right there. Then you got another. Uh, great episode, kind of adjacent, not again, not directly Calvinist, but it's going to tie into a lot of what we talked about this week coming next week. But for now, we'll wrap right there. This has been the next episode of the Think Deeper podcast. Thank you guys so much for joining. We'll talk to you next week.